as uh, as and uh, we're going to talk about the second part of integrative uh, oncology. And I hear good news from Dr. Patel because she's one of the uh, the CDPM physician, and she's using uh, and injecting immunotherapy and chemotherapy and photosensitizers, everything. So really, if you have anybody with cancer and you need somebody who's adapting all the things that we are learning here, I think Dr. Patel uh, Kalpara is the one, and she has great results. And uh, hopefully she will come here and she will share her cases. Uh, just today, she talks about the case with uh, head and neck cancer, and she's injecting the lymph nodes with all those low dose chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, photosensitizers, and she's activating with light. She's doing the ozone. She's doing vit high vitamin C. She's doing interferon gamma. She's doing uh, anti PDL1, anti CTL4, things that we learn from integrative uh, oncology part one. She's all applying it all together. And she's getting great, great, great results. And I told her, you know, to document everything so we can have uh, a clinical cases that, that, that translate what we are learning here into clinical. And also, I recommend everybody here, you know, to move forward with integrative oncology. I mean, I can see there's a society of integrative oncology out there, and it's been run by um, uh, osteopathic, uh, no, it's been run by naturopath doctors. And I think as you as osteopath or MD, you can do better than the naturopath doctors in, in managing and, and doing all those uh, um, injections, intratumor injection, which proven to be more effective than um, IV. And even if you inject, let's say this in her case, it's a skin cancer, squamous cell carcinoma, and it's spread all over her lymph node, uh, has lymph nodes in his neck. And he refused to do, can you hear me guys? Hopefully you can. His, are you with me here? Can you hear me, guys? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay. Yeah. So, so, and uh, and it's squamous cell carcinoma on the skin. This is the case I just learned from from what she did, and it 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 spread all over her, his, his neck, lymph nodes. And I don't think he decided to do surgical, which I will prefer removing all the lymph nodes of the neck. I did it myself for the thyroid cancer that I had, uh, but he decided not because then after that they're going to do chemotherapy. So. Um, those patients who decide not to do chemotherapy and surgical, they want to find another options. So you can do intertumor injections. So when she inject the lymph nodes, and if you just inject one or two lymph nodes with tumor, um, this with, with Optiva, with anti-PDL1, anti-CTL4, those immunotherapy, it will activate the immune system and it will, it will enhance the, uh, the, the immune reactivation all over the body, including all the other pieces of the metastasis that the patient has from other parts of the lymph nodes or his, in his lung, I think he's stage four cancer. And uh, he start having that improvement. He's able to swallow. So that's mean they're shrinking in his lymph nodes of his uh, neck. And I think he's, he's feeling better and better. And, and so um, if you have metastasis, you know, and you say, well, I just inject one or two tumor, that injection of all those ther therapies that we talked about, the immuno, chemo, uh, photosensitizers all together, um, including loading them inside nanotech, which is P P PNP, platelets nanoparticles. That's, that's the secrets of, of why this is working. Um, th this will be enough because this will activate the immune system and, and cause shrinking and destruction of, of, of all other tumors and all other sites. So intertumor injection, it's, it's way better than IV. Um, it has 1000 times more effect efficacy than doing it IV. So I think we learned uh, all the methods, all the uh, 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 procedures that we are doing in immunotherapy from the first uh, lecture for integrative uh, immune oncology part, part one. Um, this one, we're gonna see other um, methods uh, to um, activate the immune system. And we're gonna focus uh, mainly on uh, phosphatidylserine and we're gonna learn about it as it is um, immune blockade uh, receptor. And we, we're gonna learn how to block it in order to activate the immune system to attack the tumor. And we learned from the part one of integrative uh, uh, immune oncology that uh, we have three phases of, uh, of, of, of how the tumor is emerged. 
um, and escape the immune system. Bef bef we know that the surveillance, the surveillance of the of the immune system has three phases. One is the first phase, which is elimination, and then we have the second one is equilibrium, and the third one is um, elimination. And um, uh, we learned that it will be good if we prevent the tumor from moving to equilibrium or shift whatever tumor that went to equilibrium back to, uh, uh, to, to uh, elimination phase. And uh, we develop a cocktail of supplements uh, that, that's supposed to be taken um, for everybody here because you have a chance of, of one to uh, two, that's mean 50% of anybody here in this room will have cancer, 50% will have cancer during your life a time. Uh, that's proven, recommended, uh, documented. And uh, because of that, I would recommend everybody here to be on uh, polyphenols, on vitamin D, especially vitamin D. Uh, I mean, the mainstream medicine here in the United States and the societies here, they don't recognize vitamin D as a prevention of cancer, but the Society of Canada Oncology, they did. And uh, that's the first step forward. <laughs> And they said 1,000 international units per day is um, a recommended dose to prevent cancer, not osteomalacia and not rickets. This I'm talking about, um, I'm talking about cancer. So this is the first time I see mainstream medicine um, consider one of the vitamin as, uh, as, as a prevention of cancer. So they recommend 1,000 international units. I, I recommend even more, I, you know, we need to make sure that we optimize the level of vitamin D and, and, and it's wrong to say, just give 1,000 everybody because people are different in their metabolism of vitamin D. Some people, they cannot absorb it. If they have vitamin A deficiency, carotenoid deficiency, they cannot absorb vitamin uh, D. So if you give them 1,000 international unit orally, it's not going there. It's not, the body will not take it. So it's very important to normalize the level of carotenoids because the carotenoids will mature the gut epithelium and maturation of gut epithelium is very important to absorb all other nutrition, including vitamin D. So I will add to that um, recommendation also vitamin D, uh, vitamin D, vitamin A, carotenoids. I will recommend polyphenols, spirulina, low-dose naltrexone, methylene blue. Um, I think Dr. Uh, uh, William Bill talked about naltrexone and how it's benefit cancer before, and I think I, I will do recommend that and also a low-dose naltrexone, low-dose methylene blue, and low-dose low uh, along with spirulina and possibly aloe vera. All of this will definitely help uh, in, in preventing of cancer. Um, it, it's very important that, you know, just targeting cancer cells uh, using chemotherapy, photodynamic therapy, radiotherapy is not enough. That's an old school of oncology. You know, the mainstream oncologists, what they do, they just give high dose chemotherapy, high dose uh, radiotherapy, and they destroy both the cancer and your healthy tissue and your immune system. Um, and they don't even have any regard about the tumor microenvironment. The new school is that, no, we, we, we destroy those cancer cells, but also we need to change the tumor microenvironment to become a hostile environment in a state of a favorable environment. And uh, so we need to polarize the immune system uh, to TH1 and one, we're gonna learn that. And we need to put the immune suppression equation of the tumor microenvironments, which led to the tumor escape, one of the mechanisms of tumor escape. And we're gonna learn about this immune blockade, uh, phosphodiserine, a receptor that polarizes the immune system away from TH1 and one. We, we're gonna learn about it today. We're gonna learn how to block it. And we need to put it as one of the equation, what are the factor in treatment of cancer. And we're gonna learn about the antibody uh, mediated phosphodiesterine blockade, activate the immune system, polarize the immune system to TH1 and 1. We're gonna learn that today. Um, again, if you see here, uh, in order for the um, immune system, in order for the tumor to, um, to flourish and, uh, and, and, uh, and to grow and, and divide and become cancer, um, they, they need to, um, so, you, so, so, so those are the mechanism of the, of the tumor, uh, emerging of the tumor um, um, is, is that the tumor cells or the cells will have some mutations in their pro-oncogenes, which led the, the tumor to divide uncontrollable and uh, without stop. And they will be, um, 
uh, uh, kind of uh, will not respond to any external stimulus. They just divide, divide, divide. Normal cells, when they divide and they touch to surfaces, it's called contact surfaces. This contact surfaces will send signals that wouldn't have the proliferation. Um, those cancers, they don't respond anymore because of the mutation and they start growing and expanding um, regarding of contact inhibition. So they don't have the contact inhibition that there's a mutation there in, in, that, in that piece, which they don't respond to anymore. And so they grow in size uh, and they start pressing and destroying everything surrounding it, secreting enzymes to destroy the normal tissue. And they have no regard of the space um, because the mutation of that pro-oncogenes um, did in, inhibit or stop the, the contact inhibition. Um, and of course, in order for the tumor to grow, they, they need to secrete enzymes that will break the surrounding normal tissue and, and let them to expand. Um, and also, um, you know, um, those tumors, uh, uh, they, they need to replicate. And those tumors, they will replicate um, immortality. That's mean they will divide and they will not stop dividing. And that's because of the, the mutation and in, in those genes. And, you know, those, those uh, pro-oncogenes, they are being mutated. And also, um, they change the mitochondria where it become leaky to free radicals. And those free radicals will feed and signal the uh, pro-oncogenes to activate um, uh, and stop and divide and stop. So you have still cycles continue going in the circle uh, and it's not moving back into G0 anymore. Um, and, uh, and also they, they, they also have all the signals that helps those tumors to implant into other tissues. Um, there will be signals that they respond to uh, that led them to migrate to those metastasized sites and they, they, that there will be uh, chemicals that helps them um, to uh, able to implant into distant tissues and, and, and lead to metastasis. Um, in order for tumor to grow also, they need to secrete um, chemicals, uh, growth factors uh, that stimulate the growth of the blood vessels because they need to be fed. And the, the tumor do secrete a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, angio angiogenesis growth factors, uh, which we call them uh, endothelial growth factors that helps to increase the, the blood vessels in the tumor to feed, to, fed the, to feed the tumor. And those blood vessels, they are abnormal blood vessels of the tumor. They are wide, kinky, and uh, they are leaky, but they are kinky in the way they allow nutrients and sugar to pass through, but they will not allow the white blood cells to pass through. So they decrease, this will lead to decrease in the lymphocyte infiltrations. So they increase the, 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 the increase the vasodilation. Uh, yes, and they are torches shaped blood vessels of normal. Yes, you will increase the, the, the blood flow in terms of nutrients, ox the, the, especially the, sh the, the, the sugar, uh, but it will be squeezed by the fibrosis um, of the tumor, which will prevent the lymphocytes from infiltrating. That's part of the trick of uh, providing that microenvironment, tumor microenvironment that enhance the tumor growth. And that's how the tumor is tricking us, uh, or tricking the body, uh, because it prevents the T lymphocytes from infiltrating. So you would have poor T lymphocytes infiltrating. That's part of evading the immune system. Um, in addition to that, the uh, apoptotic genes will be mutated uh, and they will not be responding to the free radicals level that normal cells respond and that led to apoptosis. Uh, the bar of the free radicals, the level of redox potential is going to be very high uh, for those uh, cancer cells to induce an apoptosis. And, um, and so they're being mutated and, and that prevent them from dying and they will continue dividing and surviving as immortal cells. Uh, replacing us as normal tissue. You can say it's like an alien. Um, and, and so the, the other thing is that if you see the tumor, there is inflammation, but what kind of inflammation? We learned that there is three kinds of inflammation. There is TH1 dominant inflammation, which we needed to kill the cancer. 
There is TH2 inflammation, which is, you know, gives you that allergy and histamine release uh, and basophil and isinophil. Uh, we don't want that inflammation, but that's the tumor they use. They use that inflammation. It's the inflammation of TH2 and also inflammation of TH17 and TH into nucleus 6 where neutrophilia, and you don't need neutrophilia really to kill cancer, but that's how the tumor microenvironment tumor is doing, is, is, is moving the inflammation from the TH1, M1 mediated, which is very important to kill the cancer using cytotoxic T cell CD8, and polarizing the immune system into TH2 and into TH17. And those are, inflammations are useless, but it's good for, for growing of the tumor. And, and it drains the whole immune system into wrong direction. It's fooling the immune system. And instead of polarizing to TH1, M1, and cytotoxic T cells to kill the cancer, they're polarizing the immune system into, uh, into leukin-6 uh, mediated immune system, which is TH17 and into leukin-4 uh, and TH2. And what will happen is that you will have inflammation there, but you would have the neutrophils and you would have basophils, mesophils. And, and those inflammation, actually, it's in favor of the tumor because interleukin-6 will increase the blood flow, will, will cause fibrosis. Um, so it's, it's really, um, it, it activates the platelets, it increases the platelets. Um, and that's why the tumor, you will see a lot of patients with tumor that the, their platelets is high. And, and they use the platelets as a shield to cover those tumor cells from the immune system. They use the fibrosis as well to squeeze the blood vessels to prevent T lymphocytes from infiltrating the tumor. Um, and, and, and yes, you will see the dysregulations of the tumor epigenetics. So it will be expressing all the proteins that favor the tumor growth uh, as we see it here. Um, and they will increase the, the expression, for example, of endothelial growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factors to increase the angiogenesis. For example, they, they may express interleukin 10 to stimulate T regs and M regs to suppress the immune system. You know, that's how the tumor is. They, they change epigenetics in the way they express immune signaling, immune suppressing signaling that will favor the, the, the tumor growth. If you see the slides here, uh, we just talked about it. I mean, we will see that there is two kinds of inflammation, as you see here. There is a good inflammation that we need to kill the cancer, which is mediated by TH1, M1, and cytotoxic T cell, which is the green one. See that? And there is inflammation that is actually causing the tumor to grow and suppress the, the immune system, not the whole immune system, the immune system that we need to kill the cancer, which is M1 and TH1 and cytotoxic T cells. So if you see the green one, is that the immune system we need in order to kill the cancer? We need to polarize the immune system to TH1, M1, cytotoxic T cells. But the, the tumor, what it does, it polarizes the immune system away from TH1 and M1. And so we polarize the immune system into TH2 and TH17 and Tregs. So what you will see in the tumor microenvironments you will see high cytokines of uh, interleukin-4, you will see interleukin-10, transforming growth factor. Um, all of this will polarize the immune system away from TH1, M1. And we need, in order to manage those cancer, in order to manage those tumor microenvironment, to make it a hostile environment tumor instead of favorable environment tumor, we need to polarize the immune system to TH1, M1. And low Zartan, low dose, one of them, because we learned from Dr. Bill William that he said that, well, you know, low Zartan inhibit the T at 17 and interleukin 6. And if you inhibit that, then this will lead to polarization of the immune system into TH, TH1. Uh, we have other doctors, they are using repurposing drugs and they are using antihistamines for cancer uh, because antihistamine doesn't have the TH2. You need to inhibit that. Uh, some other uh, do doctors are using, um, uh, they are using, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, they're using uh, uh, antifungal drugs because antifungal drugs uh, does inhibit um, uh, the, 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 the TH17 and interleukin 6 and they use antifungal drug for that. Uh, ivermectin, for example, it doesn't have the TH uh, uh, 
um, 17 into Duke and 6, Metlam Blue, um, and, and many other repurposing drugs, anything that inhibits into Duke and 6, it's going to be good for, for managing cancers. And, and there is antibodies uh, that they develop to inhibit into Duke and 6 and TH17 activities and into Duke and 17. Um, um, interleukin 17s and, and, and antibodies, and, and they're using it for cancer. So we can polarize the immune system into Th1, M1. Okay, are, are you there, guys? Can you hear me, guys? Because I don't see you, so I don't know. Very yes, good. it's great. Thank you very much, Dr. Alasa. We're okay, here. can you see my face or you don't see my face? We do not see your face. At least yeah, I don't. I'm I'm seeing my phone, that's the reason. Okay, not, not, that's fine. Okay, so let's go ahead and, uh, and I, didn't, I think we already talked about the last, uh, the first part of the integrative oncology. We talked about elimination and uh, equilibrium and escape. And- Dr. Uh, Dr. Halasha, can, yes. I, can I interrupt you for a minute? Uh -huh. And uh, I was just wondering that, um, you know, clinically, we are able to measure certain things. And most of the physicians know to check patient for the transforming growth factor, beta, uh, TGF beta. So, so if patient has a high amount of TGF beta, how do they interpret it? So transforming growth factor beta, it either polarized the immune system into uh, TH17 or T-Rex. And really it depends on the ratio of interleukin 10 and interleukin 6. So if you have transforming growth factor beta high and you have interleukin 10 is high, then you will see T-Rex, which is not good for cancer because this will suppress the cancer. This will suppress the macrophages and turn them into um, MREX. And if the transforming growth factor is high and interleukin-6 is high, then it will polarize the immune system TH17, not good for cancer as well. So both sides, if you see tumor transforming growth factor beta is high, it's not good. That's mean you have polarizations away from M1, TH1 cytotoxic T cells. And there is antibodies to inhibit the transforming growth factor beta, but it's not FDA approved. It's off label. And we can only do it offshore um, for, those, for, for those antibodies. And, and the reason why, because you know, if you inhabit the transforming growth factor beta, it's good for cancer, but it may trigger autoimmune diseases in other places. And that's why antibodies, um, anti-blockade antibodies, their approval of it, it takes a little bit time and the only way we can speed the process is loading them inside nanoparticles to get them into cancer more than going all over the body. So transforming why do we, the factor beta why do is not we good. Need, why do we need the blockade? The blockade for transforming growth factor beta? Correct, correct. Yeah, because if you block it, you block the receptors, you may be able to, um, to prevent the polarization of the immune system into Tregs or into TH17, depend on, as I said, the ratio uh, of the interleukin 10 and interleukin 6. So it's good. It will help to polarize the immune system. Those blockade will help polarize the immune system into TH1 M1. And that's what we want. You got my point? Yeah, but can we, it is not available. It's so not available. by using any any other peptide, can we can we achieve Yeah, this so thymosin alpha will be good. It polarizes the immune system to TH1. Um, you're already using interferon gamma. You're using Optiva. Uh, anti PDL1, anti, uh, those are FDA approved. Anti PDL1, using anti CTLA4, all of these will help to polarize the immune system into TH1 and, and M1 and reactivate the immune system. The inflammation that we need. So in cancer, there's, as I said, there's three kinds of inflammations there is the TH1 M1, which that's what we need, but we don't want TH2 inflammation, the interleukin 4 you know, histamine, mast cells. I don't want that for cancer. And I don't want neutrophils. So if we inhibit this, this will provide more native, naive T cells to be available to be polarized to TH1 and 1. And if you see here in this screen, you will see that when we have a very good balanced immune system and we have enough of cytotoxic T cells and we have enough of polarization to TH1 and 1, 
then we have very nice immune surveillance of cancer. And this is very important. And, uh, but once anything that causes polarization, imbalance in the immune system, polarization away from Th1, M1, and your immune system is, is moving too much into Th2 or too much into Th17, then this will put us at risk of having cancer. And that's what's happened to post-COVID-19 patients. You hear about patients with post-COVID-19, even COVID patients, they, they trigger cancer. And if they are in remission, they will have, they will have recurrency. And that, why? Because the post-COVID-19 and all the problem of the spike receptor uh, overactivating the angiotensin uh, 2 type 1 receptor, which leads to overactivation of uh, interleukin-17 and neutrophilia and, and, and moving that immune system away from Th1M1. And you have that vicious circle, it seems like continuing uh, that kind of subclinical autoimmunity mediated by Th17. And it goes exhaustion to the immune system and, and leads to putting the patient at risk of having cancer because they don't have enough of cytotoxic T cells for the immune surveillance um, and to uh, prevent them from going to escape. Face. So we can we can use that TGF beta uh, as a, one of the marker to yes. to to see that uh, how the patient is responding. Was may uh, what I have found in my practice that TGF beta is also very elevated in patients who are exposed to mold and mycotoxin. So right. so we, that we, means, we know that mold and mycotoxic what it does. It polarized the immune system, the same thing to T at 17 to leukin 6, which is part of it. You will see also transforming growth factor beta is high. It's because T at 17 and M17, they also secrete uh, transforming growth factor beta along with the leukin 6. So that's the reason. So it's not, it's, that's, that's why we need to kill those fungus and the antifungal drugs, this is the beauty of them. They kill the fungus, but also it inhibit the TH17 to leukin 6. So it has anti-inflammatory, antimicrobial effect, okay? And we are taking advantage for the anti-inflammatory effect of it. Um, and, and we use repurposing it for cancer. You got my point? Yes. And also now, for managing uh, fungus infections. So so now then the cases where the, the we can, we can probably monitor the level of TGF beta, and if patient is not responding well, and the and the levels are going up, where would you go? If you're if you we are doing everything what you have said, but still, if if it is if going up and not coming down, then where would you go? Well, let, let me see here. I mean, first of all, the lab is good uh, as an evidence of your. Uh, uh, treatment is working or not, but also the clinical. So if you see shrinking of the tumor, things is better with other things. Um, so you need to put all of that in the equations, uh, not just uh, transforming growth factor. Uh, so I like in, when you use tumor markers, also you use the, uh, the, the tumor, because if you sometimes, and in general, the tumor markers, right? When you do chemotherapy during the tumor, during your treatment, your tumor marks will go up. Is that indication your treatment is failing? No, it's because when you destroy all those cells, all those bad cells and cancer cells and all that stuff, um, they start releasing all those marks. And it's wrong to judge your treatment based on the tumor marker during the treatment. So you need to keep at least two months from stopping the treatment and then use the tumor markers and find out if, if your treatment that, that it's working or not. Um, I think in general, whether it is immune markers or cancer markers, I think we can gouge the treatment based on shrinking of the tumor, even not during the treatment, because when you are attacking those tumors, and you experience that yourself, Dr. Patel, you're saying, oh, well, I'm doing the treatment. And when I do the MRI during the treatment, it's you see well, the, the volume of the tumor is increasing. That's because of you're destroying it and you have inflammation, and that's why it's increasing in size. But uh, talk to me after two months from the treatment and let me know what's before and after. And if your tumor is not shrinked and it's increased after two months from stopping the treatment, then the treatment is not working and, or, you know, that's part of the course of the progression of the tumor. You, you got my point? Yes, thank you. All right, good. Um, so again, 
here, we need to keep the balance of the immune system um, and we need to have an active TH1M1. And that's what will strengthen your immune surveillance and it will strengthen your elimination phase. And if anything that leads to immune imbalance and polarization away from TH1M1, the tumor will can, can take advantage over that and start escaping. Um, and you will get into the equilibrium phase where the number of the tumor that's emerging equal to the number of that's dying from the immune destruction, but then it will may enter into the escape phase where you have a clinical tumor growing. And at that time, the supplement will be an adjunct, but really you need to move forward to high dose of all the polyphenols and chemotherapy, radiotherapy, immunotherapy at that stage. Um, and, and those big pharma, what they do, the mainstream medicine, they say, well, the supplement is not working here. We have clinical trials, we need vitamin D with patients with cancer, and there's no really any effect there. Yeah, it's not. You have a massive tumor all over, you're not going to kill it with vitamin D. Vitamin D can act as an adjunct, but you still need to use chemotherapy. But where we see the effect of the uh, supplements is in prevention or in pushing the tumor from equilibrium to elimination or preventing elimination phase to going to equilibrium. So once you have imbalanced, then this will lead to escape. I should see it here where you see a lot of other cytokines like transforming growth factor into leukin six is high. Um, so patients who are obese, for example, weight, um, and that's what we have, 60% of adult population in the United States, overweight. Overweight uh, and obesity leads to overactivation of TH17 to leukin 6. So you see patients with obese into leukin 6 of them is higher than a healthy uh, average weight person. And that's not good because patients who are obese have higher risk of having cancer. Why? As you see it here because they have too much of polarization of the immune system away from TH1M1 and too much of interleukin-6, it's not good. And, and so I like interleukin-6, and I think Dr. William Bill will like it too, because he saw that not, no dose naltrexone does lower the interleukin-6, so I can use it for prevention of cancer, and I can use it for treatment as well. Um, and so if you see here in the tumor microenvironment, I think Dr. Patel has a very good lecture about tumor microenvironment. Hopefully she will bring her cases along with her presentation one time. I'm still waiting for her lecture. She cannot make it Mon this Monday. So I don't know, I'm gonna figure I will out do somebody. It, uh, next, next, uh, next yeah. lecture, my next lecture will be tumor microenvironment. Okay, great. Because so, uh, now I need to figure out who's gonna be doing on um, this Monday. Um, so if anybody here wants to volunteer, present in my conference on Monday, that would be great uh, because now I don't have anybody in Monday. So anyway, tumor microenvironment, if you see it here, this picture is very clear um, that you will see um, cancer stem cells, you know, one of the difficult to treat because they behave like normal cancer cells. They also have very good antioxidant capacity. So even when you do radiotherapy and chemotherapy, you're trying to increase the free radicals to induce apoptosis of those cancer cells, they can produce enough of antioxidant to neutralize that and knock that out. So they are very difficult to treat. Um, so, um, and, 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 and so, so that's the reason, or the way that we can get the cancer stem cells um, on, and manage it is to use polyphenols uh, during your chemotherapy and high dose chemotherapy polyphenols like uh, curcumin because an ECGC, uh, um, uh, 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 resorbitrol, uh, QQ10, um, all of this may help to increase the sensitivity of the apoptotic genes to the free radicals of the chemotherapy radiotherapy. So if you combine, but I need low dose, not oral. Um, I need, I mean, high dose, IV, IV curcumin, IV ECGC, IV Quercetrine. Um, low dose not good because low dose can be antioxidant. You want it to be pro-oxidant, so use the high dose. The high dose might even see that may help to increase the sensitivity of those cancer cells to the free radical generated by photodynamic or radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So you need IV them with the uh, polyphenols, and you need really to get rid from cancer. Uh, uh, stem cells, you need immunotherapy. There is no question about it. Chemotherapy failed to manage cancer uh, stem cells. Um, and uh, we need immunotherapy, uh, anti bdl one anti-CTL4, and anti uh, uh, serine, which we're gonna learn today. Um, 
Uh, very important. We know that the fibroblast and fibrosis is not good, right? Because um, we know that, that the tumor secretes chemicals that stimulate fibrosis. Um, they, they really express on their surfaces too much of angiotensin two type one receptor. Do you remember that angiotensin two type one receptor? The tumor overexpressed them. And why they overexpress them so they can get the signaling that will activate interleukin 17 and interleukin 6. And interleukin 6 itself will stimulate fibrosis, will stimulate those fibroblasts to generate a lot of fibrosis and tumor. And, and they want those fibrosis because that fibrosis will squeeze those blood vessels, those kinky blood vessels to prevent the infiltration of lymphocytes. So they are squeezing the blood vessels from invasion of the, uh, of the lymphocytes. So what will happen if you don't have enough lymphocytes? You cannot kill the tumor. And that's the, the tricky thing. So they, they, they make the blood vessels kinky, diluted to, yes, there, there will be, helps in defeating them with nutrients. But at the same time, the fibrosis, along with the kinky blood vessels, uh, it's like a house and you kink it. You will allow nutrition, but will not allow the lymphocytes from infiltrating. And that's why we need to inhibit the fibrosis by all being. And we can inhibit it by, by losartan um, and block that. So we can, we, can, we can do that. And also we can have it by uh, shockwaves. We can break those fibrosis at zero by shockwaves and allowing those T lymphocytes to go in. And we need to normalize the blood vessels um, and using Avastin. Avastin is antibodies that blocks the vascular detergent factor, VGF. Dr. Patel is using it for her patient, great success. By the way, she's the only doctor that I know um, worldwide because I, I'm looking at all those YouTubes and all those updated immune oncology, the mainstream doctors I'm talking about. And nobody up to now is combining all those things, nanotech, immunotherapy, intratumor injections. So she's doing it all. So she will be leading because she will give us all the experiments, all the experience uh, that we need to really know where this is working or not. And she tells us this is working or not. And we're using low dose. So she's safe, peace of mind um, and treating the cancer. So we don't get the side effects of high dose chemotherapy. So that's the beauty of it. And the patients are pleased because they don't suffer from high dose chemotherapy, which is knocking down the immune system and healthy tissue and gives them that nausea and vomiting. And uh, so it's called target therapy, low dose chemotherapy, immune therapy, uh, photosensitizer. We may, we're working on doing radio frequency ablation as well. So hopefully we'll have a, an offsite center doing that maybe in Bahamas. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on. So let's see here, this picture about tumor microenvironment. It's a beautiful one, right? So uh, if you see here, this is the necrosis and it's like a cystic and I think Dr. Patel, she's talking about this case and she's trying to pull the tissue out. Uh, she's cystic, but it's, it's necrosis. And necrosis, it's like a gel. It will not be aspirated easily unless it's being liquefied. So with time, it's gonna be liquefied and turn to cystic liquid where she can draw it. But right now she is getting her tumor cystic, which is a progress, that's a good. If you turn the tumor into cystic, from solid to cystic, that means necrosis. Take give it time and it will liquefy. Those macrophages will start eating them and destroy them, and they will become cyst of liquid. So those are necrosis in the center here. Um, and those are the tumor cells, the, the, the purple one as you see it here. And this is a prostate cancer, by the way. And if you see the pale red ones, as you see it here, that's surrounding the pale red. So you have dark red or what we call purple, that's the tumor. And then the pale red is fibrosis. See that fibrosis? And the fibrosis, too much of fibrosis there, which are squeezing the blood vessels, uh, those kinky, those blood vessels, and, and preventing um, uh, lymphocytes infiltration. So fibrosis is not good when you see a tumor or too much of fibrosis. This is in a way it enhanced the tumor growth. It's in favor of the tumor. So we need to break that fibrosis. And you cannot just go do shock wave uh, and break the fibrosis and break because you may end up spreading the tumor. So make sure you're giving the treatment first and you're giving enough of chemotherapy, radio, uh, photosensitizers, immunotherapy before you use the shockwave. Otherwise you may be spreading the tumor doing that without treatment. Okay, um, oops. 
Here we go. Let me see. Okay, let's go into the next. Can you see the next slide? Are you there, guys? Okay, good, I think. So here we see in those slides, just to show the tumor microenvironment in, in slides, and I'm trying to make it bigger so you can see it. Um, so you see the green one is the tumor cells, right? And it seems like um, the, uh, so the green, green one tumor cells, and if you see the red ones are the macrophages, okay? And the, so the blue, the, the green is tumor, the red is macrophages, and possibly the blue is the stroma, okay? Okay, so macrophages, a lot of macrophages there, right? What do you think? Those macrophages are good macrophages or bad macrophages? Are they enhancing tumor or suppressing the tumor immunity? They, those macrophages are bad ones. They are M regs. They are M17 and they are M2. And they are not good because they are polarizing the immune system away from TH1 M1. And um, we need to really turn them into M1. And can we turn them into M1? Yes, we're using anti-PDL1, anti-CTL4, using all the drugs, what we talked about, we can polarize the immune system into TH1, M1, using Lozartan, using uh, uh, naltrexone, using metalum blue, all of this may help to turn those and switch them um, from MREG, M2 into uh, M1, and that will activate the cytotoxic T cells and kill the cancer. So those are uh, uh, not good macrophages here. We need to turn them into good ones, which is M1 from M2 or MREGs. Okay, another slide. And you see here the tumor cells are uh, blue and then the greens are the macrophages and then the stroma is, uh, is the red. And you see also some blood bezels there. And you see the macrophages is on the border. It's on the stroma there and they are suppressor macrophages. Um, they are not good, they are MREGs, M2, M17, and we need to turn them into uh, M1 using all the treatment that Dr. Patel is using in her cocktails of uh, polarizing the immune system to TH1, M1. Uh, so this is the picture also showing the macrophages here. Also here you see the tumor, um, you see the stroma is red, and then those are the greens are macrophages, and then the black ones are the tumor. And if you see here, the macrophages are, as I said, they are the embregs, uh, they are uh, myeloid suppressor cells, immune suppressor cells, derived uh, suppressor cells are not good. They are uh, enhancing the tumor growth, those macrophages. And we need to turn them into M1 um, in order to turn the, TH, to the naive T cells to TH1 and uh, to secrete all the cytokines that we need, which is interleukin-2 and transforming growth factor uh, that leads to um, um, polarizing the immune system and, and gives you enough of cytotoxic T cells that we need to kill those cancer cells. So this is how showing the tumor microenvironment is very important to be managed. And we need to turn those macrophages from MREGs, M1, uh, myeloid derived suppressor cells into M1, and then M1 will activate the T cells to TH1. Um, and we need to break those fibrosis, and we need to change the microvasculature uh, from kinky and, uh, and, and torches into normal ones. And not, it's not good to do too much of a vastin because then you will not have a way to infiltrate the lymphocytes, unless you want to say, no, I want to cut off the blood vessels completely uh, by the procedure we know, the coagulation thing or breaking those blood vessels using heat, radio frequency ablation, then that's another thing. That's, that's another thing that's, then you can use high dose of Vastin. But in this case, we wanna give a Vastin a way to normalize it. Because if you do too much of it, it's not good, then you don't have enough of blood vessels to supply the soldiers, which are the lymphocytes and uh, the, 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 the lymphocytes and the macrophages, the M1s, that we need to, to use it to fight the cancer. 
Okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. So, uh, as you see here that in the tumor, because of the tumor secretes interleukin 10 and they, they, they interleukin 6, as we talked about, transforming growth factor, and they polarize the immune system away from Th1, M1. They polarize them into Tregs, Mregs, as you see it here. See that, what's happening here? And what we need is to polarize the immune system into Th1, M1, cytotoxic T cells, which is on the right side. And we can do that using antibody blockades, whether anti pdl one or anti-CTLA4, or we could use um, anti-phosphatidyl serine um, um, antibodies. We're gonna learn how anti-phosphatidyl serine antibodies works in polarizing the immune system from MREG into M1. Uh, but this just shows you how you have on your left side, you will see, um, and in the right side, you will see, uh, let me see, you will see, sorry. So the left side, left side where we see low level of myeloid derived suppressor cells. So the left side is the tumor size, tumor microenvironments. And when we treat them, we expect that we can see, um, um, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. The right side is the, uh, is the tumor microenvironments, which are suppressing the immune system. And you see high level of myeloid dysplastic uh, 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 the myeloid dis derived dis uh, suppressor cells, which is the MREGs and the M1, as you see there. And you see high level of transforming growth factor to leukin 10, to leukin 4, to leukin 4. And this will definitely, as I said, we will suppress the right immune system, which is the Th1 M1, to attack the cancer cells. So this is not good. And what we need to do is polarize the immune system into Th1, M1, and cytotoxic T cells by giving those antibody blockades, by giving all those repurposing drugs, by giving low dose naltrexone that inhibits the Th17 interleukin 6 polarization, have the MREGs polarization, and it leads to polarization of the immune system to M1 and Th1, even giving thymosin um, alpha and giving interferon gamma, which is on the left side, as you see it here. Okay, and this will give me enough of activated. TH1 cytotoxic T cells to kill uh, the cancer. Okay. Okay, so um, as we see here, that um, phosphodiserine is a problem in, in tumor management. Um, and phosphodiserine is expressed on the surface of the tumor. And why they're expressing it on the tumor surface is the way to polarize the immune system to MREG and M2. So when the macrophages eats those tumor cells, those, tumor, those macrophages polarize into M2 and MREG, and that's not good. That's the way that the tumor is evading the immune system. And so when you have a tumor that on their surface, a lot of, of phosphodiserine, then when the macrophages goes and eat them, right, it will turn into MREG and M2, and that's not good. And the idea here is how I can block the phosphodiserine and uh, uh, surface receptors by using antibodies. And if we do that, then this will prevent the polarization of the macrophages. Um, uh, this will prevent them from polarizing to M2 and MREG and lead to polarization into M1, and that's what we need for cancer. Okay, so phosphodiserine exposed to the external surface of the cell um, and vehicle, the tumor microenvironment, which is something not good. That is the reason why, one of the reasons why we see polarization away from Th1 and M1. That's the reason why the macrophage, when they eat the tumor, they, they're supposed to be moving to Th1 and one supposed to be moving to M1 and then activate Th1, but the reality is that they turn into MREGs. Um, and we're going to know why in the coming slides. So phosphodiserine on the surface of the tumor is not good because they are immune suppression. Because when they're being picked up by the cancer cells, they are causing those, uh, picked up by the macrophages, they are causing those macrophages to polarize into 
M reg and M2. And what happened also when they combine, when the macrophages eat, try to eat the tumor cells and uh, attach to those phosdiserine receptors, the signal of the phosdiserines, the internal signals, can cause the expression of uh, other uh, blockades, which is PD PD1 and uh, CTLA4. So that's not good, right? Because this is the main, you can say also the PSA, uh, when they get activated, the phosphodiserine, when they get PS, when they get activated, they increase the expression of PD-1 in the tumor. And that farther will turn off the cytotoxic T cells when they're trying to attack them. You will see the cytotoxic T cells when they attack the tumor cells, uh, those PD-1 acts like a key block and they react with those cytotoxic T cells and turn them off. Um, so it's an upstream of the PD-1 and CTLA-4. And, and so we need to block those phosphodiserine. And if we block it, we prevent the macrophages from polarizing into the wrong direction, into MREX and M2. And it, then they will be polarizing into M1, which is a good thing that helps us to manage the tumor as an anti-tumor response. Now, people will be start thinking, those doctors here in this room, and I hope they, I, I don't see them because I'm using my phone here. Uh, as I said, my computer is being uh, frozen. My kids are playing with it using all the games. So I don't know how many people here, but uh, people will say, what is supposed to die serene, right? Uh, phosphodiserine is part of the membranes of all our cells. Normal cells, they have phosphodiserine, but they don't, you don't see them in the outer layer of the phospholipid bilayer. So we know the membranes of any cells, and, you know, they are two layer, right? Remember that? Remember the phospholipid bilayer? There's outer and inner. And normal cells, we will see only phosphodiserine, uh, the, the phospholipids of phosphodiserine, one of one kind of phospholipids. It's only you will find them inside. You will not see them outside. What will happen if they flip and they start being shown outside? It happened. There is what there is in the proteins in this membrane causing the flip of phosphodiesterine from inside inner membrane into the outer uh, surface. And if they flip any cells, if they use it, actually those normal cells they use it, they 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 flip the phosphodiesterine, the inner layer, into the outer layer. And they do that as a signal for eat me. So let's say you have a normal cells and it got old in age and how this normal cells will signal your immune system to eat it because it's an old cells. We're not to get rid from it. It's a senescent cells. So what they do is that the, there is a protein uh, that would flip the phosphodiesterine from inner surface to outer surface. And so those old guys, old cells, will be recognized by the immune system, those senescent cells, and the macrophage will go and eat them, okay? And so the ex flipping of phosphodiesterine from inner layer to outer layer is a signal that this cell is senescent, it's old, it's ready to die. And uh, your immune system will go and eat them, but macrophages goes and eat it. Now, when the macrophage eats it uh, as senescent cells, okay? And we don't really want to trigger any inflammations and any destruction of other normal cells that's surrounding the cells, the senescent cells. So let's say you have all these young cells surrounding this old guy. You want to pick up the old guy and eat it without causing destructions of the young guys and the baby cells surrounding it. Um, and so you don't want the macrophage here to be polarized to M1. You want to polarize the macrophage to M2 or MREG uh, because this will not cause the inflammation and the autoimmune destruction of the surrounding cells. So it's a normal mechanism um, that the way that we get rid from, from the senescent cells. And what activates the flipping of phosphodiesterine from inner and outer is free radicals. So if you have a cell that's old, and they don't produce enough of antioxidants and they have too much of free radicals and they have a lot of damage, then those free radicals will activate those proteins that flips the phosphodiesterine to outside and tell you this cell is old in age 
and needs to die. So the macrophages will go and eat them and become an MREG or M2, but they will not be become uh, M M1, which is a good thing, okay? Because you don't want an M1. If it's M1 and they start produce stimulating cytotoxic T cells, and then the cytotoxic T will start attacking those neighbor uh, normal uh, young cells, and you don't want to bother that. It's like it's like a garbage can, okay? In the morning at 5 a.m., you want the garbage can to go in quietly, not making noises, taking the rubbish without bothering the neighbor, right? You don't want somebody to go in and start, you know, making noises and causing disturbance and destructions of the surrounding uh, um, uh, neighbors. Um, so you need to quietly take that and go away. Okay, so that's normal mechanism of getting rid from the senescent cells, but the tumor cells is using it in its advantage. So that's the, that's the point here. If you see this slide here, um, I just wanna check everybody. Can you hear me guys? Are you still awake? If not, just drink coffee. Cause it's good, I as I so said, excited, it's, gonna be, Dr. Halasa. it's a hardcore kind of presentation. And uh, even the whole field, it's a new field. I myself, I have no clue about it. Uh, three years back when I was managing my dad itself. And I wish I know these things because if I know these things, I will be doing what Dr. Patel is doing with this patient with, because my dad has had neck cancer as well. He has hypophagia cancer. And I was ignorant about immunotherapy. And I was ignorant that the same immunotherapy is not giving us good hope in terms if you give them IV, yeah, it will kill the cancer, but also it will trigger autoimmune diseases and it will exhaust the immune system. So that's the failure of autoimmune uh, of immune therapy. But, but because of um, learning about nanotechnology and combining nanotechnology with immune therapy, then it makes sense. Then you can target that tumor and injecting into the tumor as well. We did inject the photosensitizers and chemotherapy into the, the cancer, but that's not enough. Guys, because we okay. need to also change the tumor microenvironment as well. And this is something I learn. And then we, I start adding things together, connecting the dots and learning from that, how I can use that technology to make the immune therapy more effective uh, by loading those antibodies in those uh, nanoparticles. Now, Dr. And, Halata, uh, yes, go ahead. You know, it, it's, it's already an hour and 15 minutes. If Dr. Clearfield um, Bill agrees. I think this is a heavy subject and you have as a part three so that um, you can discuss what you have. People have questions because you may have a more slides on this. And this is, this is a very important subject. Um, so whatever everybody wants, but this is one of my suggestions. Guys, are you tired? Do you want to do a part three? Or you want to continue? Dr. Patel said part three. Let me hear another voice. As you another? know, I was, I was turning it over to you, Dr. Halasa. So if you want to do a part three, we can make it April 19th. Okay. 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 Um, 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 I'm going to leave I it up to you. Though, the I... question in, there's a question in the chat that says... Okay. Um, from Dr. Horvitz, we use phosphatidylserine for people with high nighttime cortisol. Should we not use phosphatidylserine in that way? Are you using it for cancer patients or using it for what, what patients? Cortisol, for high cortisol at night? Yeah, I, there's no problem. The phosphatidylserine is part of your cells, healthy cells, and it's part of getting rid from uh, senescent cells. So, no, you use it. There's no problem with using it. The whole thing is that when we're treating cancer, we need to block those phosphodiserine of the tumor, not the normal cells. That's the problem. This, this antibody didn't, yeah, did not have FDA approval. I don't think so. They may, but this is the problem with this immune therapy. Don't take me wrong. They are good to kill cancer, but it can, it can trigger autoimmune diseases as well. And that's the reason we need to load them inside nanoparticles, latest nanoparticles, and we need to inject them into the tumor. And it can take better advantage than giving it nakedly IV. 
I mean, it's, it's, that's the reason of all the uh, hinder and the problem with immune therapy. So you yeah, continue giving phosphodiesterine. It's part of your normal cells, no problem about it. But I'm talking about when you're managing cancer, we need to block it in the tumor only as much as we can using targeted therapy approaches, whether it's intratumor or loading it inside nanoparticle. But uh, it's part of normal cells to get rid from uh, naive cells. You see here, you know, the normal dying cells, aged cells, senescent cells, how I can rid rid from it? They get they, the signal for that is flipping the phosphodiesterine from inner layer to outer layer. There is a protein inside the membrane that will sense the free radicals. If it's too much of free radicals inside the cell, that means aged cells is not able to neutralize the free radical. It's old guy. We need to get rid from it. So um, your macrophages will eat those senescent cells and, and phosphodiesterine being expressed outside or flipped outside is an expression that this cells is senescent cells and it needs to go. And, but the tumor cells taking advantage over it. And then we need to go ahead knowing that, it's taking advantage over it, find a way to block it and use antibodies. Now, here's the, the homework that I need for every, every doctor is here. Can we block phosphodiesterine with supplements, with drugs, repurposing drugs. I want to block the phosphodiesterine internally, the signal of it, can we block it? And that's where a homework for all of doctors here, find out if you can block phosphodiesterine signaling with repurposing drugs in a state of antibodies. So that will enhance the whole treatment protocol. And I need that, that from all the doctors here to be actively looking for uh, repurposing drugs or supplement that inhibit the phosphodiesterine signaling for the tumor, not for the senescent cells. Any other question? Questions? Everybody's happy? So I think it, we can do part three. Um, that would be fabulous. Part three. Okay. Another right. night. We'll another night. <laughs> Make and, sure you drink coffee. I have and, April. Uh, April 19th next is our next opening, Dr. Halas. I'll right. put you in. But I will try to squeeze all of this, hopefully, during my lecture. I don't know. If I can, I will be more faster. You only your, get an hour. We, we're very good. An busy. hour, yeah. I will, I will not be... And, know, Dr. Uh, and Dr. Farshian is after you, and you know he doesn't like to wait. I'm not going to make him wait. But uh, I will try my best to squeeze things. Uh, I'm here, relax, and I'm trying to break things down. In real lecture there, I may be just pushing things very fast so we can know that there's something important there. Okay, well, well we got you for, for April 19th, okay? Okay, good. Any questions? Everybody, everybody's happy here? That's my question to my kids too. We're, we're, everybody's we're, happy? And also Dr. Patel, she heard from me that, you know, are you happy or not, so. Yeah, no, I'm- So are you happy Dr. You know, Patel it, or not? That's important for well, me. Well, I'm happy, but uh, <laughs> why does the phosphatidyl serine Get upside uh -huh. down well, from from inner layer to the outer layer. What are the? I mean, you know, it says under normal condition and under hypoxia and etc. But uh, so yeah. so, so if I want to hypoxia. get rid from senescent cells or hypoxic cells that's being damaged or any cells that's being destroyed by too much of free radicals. So so let me ask you this then. Um, if you are saying that senescent cells, then you know that recipe of using. Um, I'll just one minute, okay? Okay. Hello, Martin. Can I call you? Okay. Thank you. So. I, yeah. I'm so sorry, I. I got this phone call. So uh, let me see where I was. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, you're talking about senescent cells. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So there was there was a um, recommendation that we may be using something like the certain, um, which is like anti-cancerous drug, um, for for maybe two days every six months and that may help to kill that and may experience increased energy and et cetera. So, so we have in, in prevention, we may be just looking at this molecule differently, looking at the condition, what, what are responsible 
for creating this abnormality and using because I I used the gasatinib because uh, uh, Dr. Purita one time mentioned in his lecture. So I it, it's very expensive, but anyhow I ordered it and I took it probably for two days, and he was right. For two days you don't feel as good, but then the following week you have an immense amount of energy. So so I think that that's something. Um, we should look into it uh, when we are thinking about doing the prevention. Well, find out the mechanism of the drug that's recommended by uh, Dr. Pureta. It may no, work. It is senescent cells. It kills the senescent cells. Okay, okay. So as I said, senescent cells, it's like cancer cells. They have too much right. of free radicals. And Metlam Blue is one of the way to kill senescent cells and the best way of doing it, possibly that drug also concentrate into those um, senescent cells and stimulate autophagy. That's right. what I can see. Right. So right. Uh, because those senescent cells and cancer cells and the flammasomes, they all have too much of free radicals inside them. And um, there is many way of killing them. One of them is inducing the mitophagy and NAD is one of them. Uh, Cucurtan is, is, is to uh, curcumin. ACGC, maybe this drug as well. Uh, but this flipping of phosphodiesterine is, is signaling the macrophages to eat them and get rid from them. Um, so we don't want to get rid from it from normal cells, uh, part of getting rid from the senescent cells. But we want to um, block it for the tumor cells as much as we can. And, and that's the reason why your work is better because you're loading those antibodies into plate nanoparticles and you're getting it more into the tumor instead of going everywhere where it affect the healthy cells. So yes, that's could be part of adding something to, and maybe that drug also that Dr. Pirate is talking about, it may help to also get, get rid from cancer cells as well. I mean, we have many so other we, we are all you, Your previous slide, you showed that, uh, you know, the evasion, and then you you are showing that equilibrium, and then then the right. loss of equilibrium. So, so then it, it makes sense that if you, I mean, you, we don't know whether we are in evasion phase or we are in equilibrium phase. One one gets diagnosed when it is out of control in proliferative phase, right. in evasion. So, so I think uh, it may be uh, worth it. And, and after 60 uh, years of age, it increases. That right. process After 50 increases. years of age, we need yeah. to have supplement pack. Everybody has to do it. I think 30 years from now, it's gonna be part of the mainstream medicine where all of us after 50, we will start having a pack of supplement every day containing all those good ingredients that helps to um, uh, balanced immune system and preventing the uh, cancer from moving from uh, elimination to equilibrium as much as, as we can. Because 50% chance of having cancer is too much. It's alarming. And it's the uh, same like the movie of Don't Look Up, you know, the DiCaprio. And me and you and all the doctors, we're telling you, hey, you know, 50% gonna have cancer and people say, okay, well, 50% is not only 90%, who cares? But as doctors, we are alarmed. And we need to take this message to the public and uh, they need to really go through the protocols and those prevention protocols that we recommend. But the big pharma, they don't want that because they want to use their chemotherapy and all that stuff. If you're preventing and decreasing the number of the cancer, you're decreasing the number of the usage of their drugs. So it's not something good for the big pharma. It's and that's why big pharma. Big pharma it's not just big pharma or FDA is corrupted. So what, what can... Why, well, why? the FDA is not being paid by preventive procedures. It's very cheap. It's being paid by the big pharma. Right. So the, the my big money is there. So and, and follow the money, uh, including the FDA. So yes. Um, and that's the reason we may need to have an offshore clinic to do all this innovative thing, especially into tumor injections and things but like then, that. How many patients can afford it? You know, that, that's a big thing. Yes, it's about the money and really for managing cancer, we don't wanna lie. You need at least uh, 100K per year minimum for the patient to survive cancer, and especially stage three and four. It's, it's costly if the government, but what we need to do, we need to have an or nonprofit organizations where they can collect money 
for their patients. So that's another way of doing it. Right. Any there other questions? There are so many big foundations. And, and you know, if, if some foundation is interested in prevention, there's a lot of $10, $10 million, nothing for those who are billionaires, you know? Well, even foundation for treatment of cancer that you're doing, if you find nonprofit foundation that are interested to sponsor you, then that would be great, sponsor your patients. That would be great. That's another thing. We may need to open this nonprofit organization. Maybe you and Dr. Bill and Dr. Klatz get together and say, hey, let's go ahead and have nonprofit organization to collect the money that will help our patients to pay for this treatment. That's another way of doing things. I don't know. It's just, we need to find answers for all this. We need some entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One to six, time one time and, yeah. One to six of death is caused by cancer. One in six. You know, an average, if somebody is diagnosed with cancer, an average, I'm talking about 30%, 33, one to three, one to third, they're going to die. No question. One to third. One to three, multiply one and a half, gives you one in six. So that's mean they, they, they find out people are dying or the death. And they find among those dead people, one to six are caused by cancer. That's very high. Uh, and nothing has been done in, 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 in I mean, the immuno oncologist doctor, they are happy because they, they develop this antibody blockades and there are many of them still not approved by FDA, by the way. And the reason because they are injecting it nakedly into the blood and it trigger autoimmune. And when you trigger autoimmune, what you're doing, you're exhausting the immune system. That's the problem of it, because now the immune system in a state of being active in the cancer is being active in the normal tissue. So there's no much of naive, naive T cells anymore there. And that's not good. And so what is the solution here is to inject those immunotherapy in the tumor and also loading inside nanoparticles, which is plated nanoparticle. That gives you what we call the target therapy. And there is a big pharma company working on it. It's not just me. It's called Cella Therapeutic. It's a big pharma. And they're using platelet nanoparticle to load with antibodies and drugs and like a cargo for all platelets, um, general plates, because platelets is not immunogenic, right? You, you take platelets from other people, you don't need to, there is no immunogenicity in, in platelets. But I'd like to use autologous uh, platelets and, 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 and that's what we are uh, entertaining. Anyway, any other questions for the docs here? Are you happy, everybody? We good? Are we good? Okay. Yes, we're good. Good night, Dr. Halasa. Okay, good night, everybody. I don't know how many people in the, in the room right now. 10? 14. Most have dropped. Oh, there, well, there, there, there were 20 before. Well, that's good. 14 is good. <laughs> okay, well, good night, everybody. Take care. And can you send me your slides, the Dr. Halasa? I'll send it to you, Dr. Patel. Okay, thank you. The most I, important some, thing. Some slides are good, so I may include in my my talk. Okay, I'll give it. I'll give you the whole thing. Okay, thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. All right. Yeah. It's a big minds. Yeah, I'm at Amati I'm at the Pasha treatment Caravaya. I'm at the Pasha treatment They are not to the standard. Canodia, the Kaima Jews, Nathan. Blahana to Kuiko Katipilla lecture, Romajo. Canodia is very much for money. I don't know. I'm a Okay, yeah, Amma, record? The catch. I'm going to leave then now. Huh? Hmm? Pachi, Pachi, how are you?